It's really nice to, to see all of you here tonight and, and talk a little bit about allergies. Now, you may say, well, is, is that all you're going to talk about tonight? Well, I could sp probably spend our entire week of evenings just talking about allergy alone, let alone all the other ear, nose, and throat things. And so I'd like to welcome you tonight and invite you, to, after we're uh, done with the talk, you're welcome to ask me anything you'd like about allergy or even about any other ear, nose, and throat problems you may have questions about. And, of course, I'd like to also welcome all the people that are watching on the web on Lisa's website because... Um, I think that there's a great opportunity here for spreading the word about how we can treat allergies and why allergies are important. So let me go ahead and, and start off. The, the real question is, is well, why, why do we even care about allergies? And, and the answer is, well, allergies are a big deal because more than 50 million Americans do suffer from allergies. And, and also, it's, it's about 20% of the population in the United States, and it's rising. There are a lot of people that think within the next 10 years it may rise to as much as 30% uh, of people in the United States have allergies. And one of the things that, that really struck me is one out of every 11 doctor's visits is due to allergy. Now, a lot of times the doctors or you may not realize that that's why you're going to see the doctor, but if you boil it down to the cause, one out of 11 doctor's visits is because of an allergy problem. Now, if we look at figures, and, and unfortunately, the latest figures weren't published as fast as I would have hoped, so I'm still talking in 2000, the year 2000 dollars. The medications cost uh, alone is $5.7 billion per year is what we spend as Americans on allergy medicines. We spend over $1.1 billion a year on going to the doctor for allergic rate related problems and, and we lose about 4 million days of work lost per person, or not per person, but 4 million person days lost. And also if you don't think it attacks kids, it certainly does 824,000 missed school days. And, and so allergies are a big problem. And another reason and why they are is because uh, of the type of symptoms that we get with allergies. They can range from very mild to actually quite severe. They can be de debilitating. They can decrease your productivity at work. If you're tired and you didn't sleep well because your nose was stuffy all night and your eyes itch and you can't read your computer screen, those are all things that get in the way of you doing a productive job at work or at school. Also, it can spoil recreational activities. I have a good number of patients that like to do sports, but if they get out on the sports field, they start having problems with allergies, and so we have to combat that. And it can also complicate social relationship, relationships. For example, if you can imagine going out on a date and you're meeting this lovely lady or lovely young gentleman for the first time, and your nose is stuffy, and runny or you've always got a Kleenex or you're always dabbing, that is just not conducive to a nice new social relationship. So it can affect that. And the other thing is, is that it can actually affect other diseases such as eczema and asthma and a few others that I'll show you. In fact, this is just kind of a little diagram of all the different kind of things that allergy touches. It touches colds because if you're allergic, your nose is going to be stuffy. It's not going to drain as well, and so you might be more prone to, to colds. You might be more prone to sinus infections for the very same reason. You might develop nasal polyps, which are these growths inside the nose. They're not a cancer. They're benign polyps, they're, but they're a growth that blocks off your nose and your nose's ability to function properly. And it may affect asthma. In fact, 60% of asthmatics have an allergic trigger to their asthma, so it's a big deal for asthmatics. And even, believe it or not, ear infections are also touched by allergies. In fact, there was a study that was done oh, about 15 years ago now out in California by a real prominent ear, ear doctor, really, that also uh, had some training in allergy. And she looked at the children in her practice for an entire year that came in that needed their second set of ear tubes. Over 90% of kids that needed their second set of ear tubes to help with ear infections tested positive for allergy. 90%. So that shows that there is something going on there between allergies and ear infections. It doesn't necessarily prove cause, but we certainly see that if we treat allergies as well as all the other inflammatory conditions that go along in the body, we actually see a great improvement in infections both in the sinuses as well as the ears. The other reason it's a big deal is because you are being bombarded with advertisements all the time by the drug companies that want you to go out and spend your $5.4 billion on their products, okay? And so we see all kinds of different ads all the time. We've got Zyrtec, Allegra, Viramist. These are all things that you may have seen ads for on TV. Who hasn't heard the, the phrase Claritin Clear? Anybody? No. We've all hear, we all, all hear that because we're being bombarded with allergy medicines. And so there is an increased public awareness about allergy. 
And then we start digging into, well, okay, that's why we might care about allergy, why allergies are a big deal. But what is allergy really? And really, if you boil it down to it, it's something very simple. It's an inappropriate reaction of your immune system. Basically, what happens is, is your immune system identifies something that's harmless as something that is harmful. And so, for example, um, you might say that, well, what's the, what's the immune system trying to do? It's trying to identify these harmful things like bacteria and viruses and get rid of them and, and keep you from getting sick. However, in, uh, in allergy, what it does is it takes these harmless things and it wrongly identifies them as something that is going to hurt you. And so it sets up the cascade of inflammation that is known as allergy. So one of the, the, what are the things that could cause? Well, anything on this list is something that could cause allergies and many other thousands of things. So the way that this works in a little more detail is that your body identifies substances to attack and it, and it chops them up and call, we call those antigens. And antigens are what we identify as the problem, okay? And then what our body makes to try and combat these antigens are antibodies. The antibodies are what bind up the bad stuff and trigger your, your body to get rid of them in one way or another. Now, there are several different types of antibodies that our body makes. The one that, the, that really is the one that's caused the cause of allergy is the one that we have labeled as doctors, IgE. And so IgE is the culprit here. And so when it gets activated and starts this inflammation going in your body, then it's something that's what we call allergy. And so how do you get allergies anyway? Well, really, to be honest with you, we really don't know for sure. But there are some things that we do know. We do know that exposure to the substances that you are likely to become allergic to has to happen many, many times. So if you bring me a one-month-old in and say, do they have allergy? Chances are probably not because they haven't been exposed to anything enough yet. But you bring in a five-year-old, can they have allergies? Absolutely. Three-year-olds? Sure, because you've been around long enough to be exposed to certain things. Now, I'll say that the things that little kids are allergic to tends to be more of foods because they get exposed to foods. That's what they're exposed to every day. They're not exposed necessarily, necessarily to ragweed pollen because ragweed pollen's got a, you know, maybe a, a six week time frame. And so if that baby was happened to be alive during that six weeks, they've had six weeks of their entire life exposed to ragweed. So the, the, the allergies are a little bit different in kids, but they definitely are there. The other thing that we know with allergies is even though we're not sure what causes it, inheritance does play a role. And this is just an allergic family, and the allergic family here has a lot of the characteristics of allergies. First off, look at the, the dark circles under the eyes, kind of have sad puppy dog eyes, you know, and there's, that's because of some puffiness beneath the eyes, sometimes from a lot of squinting because the eyes itch and you just try to do something to relieve that. Also, especially in children, the, the, the blockage that you get in your nose makes you want to breathe through your mouth. And so you see that child there, he's just breathing through his mouth. And I would imagine if you could see this up close, that this child's mouth is open too. And so you, you actually see mouth breathing with kids that have allergies. So I said they run in families. In fact, here's the statistic on it. If you have neither of your parents have allergies, your chances are about 20% of developing allergies. 20, maybe even 25 but if you have one parent that has allergies, that doubles. That rises to about 50% chance that you're going to have allergy if you have one parent that does. But if you even have both parents that have allergy, well, it's really something. It goes, rises to about 75% chance that you're going to have allergy, too. So it does tend to run in families. So we know that genetics do play a role. So well, here's the, one of the keys that I have to let you know is that the likelihood of having allergies is what you inherit. But what you're allergic to is not inherited. So just because mom was allergic to cats doesn't mean that you're going to be allergic to cats or anything else for that matter. And so a lot of times I have people come in and say, well, my mom was allergic to this, 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 and this, so I'm sure I am too. And then we start testing and find out, no, you're allergic to a whole different set of things. So it's, that's the way that the inheritance works. So this is kind of just a little laundry list of things that will cause allergies. We've got pollens from the trees. By the way, that's what's really up in the air right now is tree pollen. Maple tree, ash tree, oak tree, they're all pollinating. Mulberry is another one that's really big right now. And then there's grass pollens, and these are what pollinate in the summer. This is a picture of Timothy grass, very prominent in fields around Indiana. And then 
In the fall, we've got weeds. This is a picture of our good friend ragweed. This is what ragweed pollen looks like if you look at it under the microscope. So if you look at something like that, is there any reason why you wouldn't think that having something like that inside your nose isn't going to be irritating? I mean, really, that looks awful. That's very wicked looking stuff. But that's what ragweed pollen looks like. And oh, by the way, if you are interested in following the pollens, one of the easiest places to go on the internet is pollen.com. It's a commercial website, and so you're going to get a lot of those ads that I mentioned. However, you can plug in just about any zip code in the United States and see what's pollinating and whether the levels are low or high. And so it's a great resource for you if you want to follow pollens and then follow your own symptoms to see if you can draw a correlation. Help me, help Dr. Miller, help figure out what's going on with you. And then there's also molds. Molds are a different animal altogether. Molds can cause all kinds of problems, not only by being allergic, but also because they make toxins. And so sometimes we have people show up that they have all kinds of problems with molds, and yet you test them and they don't really show up with a whole lot of mold allergy. That may be because of direct toxic effects to the molds, and so that's something we need to look at. Actually, you would be surprised where molds can hide in your home. Molds can hide in places that you wouldn't think. Now, any place that there's moisture molds like moisture and dark and so underneath the sink if you've got a little bit of a drip to your faucet and there's moisture that collects under your sink chances are good you're gonna have some mold underneath there if you have a little bit of a leak to your roof and water runs through and kind of filters its way down behind walls another place that molds can really hide and some other places you may not think about one would be the drip pan that is underneath your refrigerator because if you have a frost-free refrigerator, what happens is, is it's got a little condenser in there that pulls moisture out of the air of your refrigerator, and that actually drips to a pan underneath your refrigerator, which you can actually pull out, and that water just sits there and it waits to evaporate. Well, if it doesn't evaporate away you know, quickly enough, you're, you can get molds underneath your refrigerator. So just bear that in mind. There's a lot of places it can hide. And then there's our friend the dust mites. Now, this is what a dust mite looks like. This is your little friend that is actually with you when you go to sleep every night. In fact, statistics would show that the average bed has about two million of them around you. So the real take home message here is that you're really never truly alone. <laughs> um, but dust mites are a big cause of allergy and one that we can take care of because we can do things to kill off dust mites. We can also do things to sequester the dust mites to where they can't get to you, putting barriers such as special sheets and pillowcases. They don't like hot temperatures, so putting your, your uh, sheets and your comforters and so forth through the washing machine at its highest heat setting and through your dryer at its highest heat setting are very good at helping to eliminate dust mites. Dust mites also like stuffed animals. So if you have a lot of stuffed animals, those are something where you need to be worried about dust mites collecting, especially if you sleep with those stuffed animals, and I think there are a couple people here that just might do that. So sleeping with, with, uh, with the, the stuffed animals is fine. Go ahead and treat the stuffed animals just like you would your sheets and your pillowcases once a week or so. Run them in the dryer at the highest setting to kill off any dust mites. And then there's pets. In fact, this is probably one of the biggest fights that we have when we're treating allergy because, uh, honestly, people love their pets. And they are willing to tolerate their allergies rather than not have their pets around. And that's just reality. In fact, I had a, a doctor today whose, uh, whose children I see, he's an anesthesiologist, and I ran into him in the hallway. And he said, you know what, we're thinking about getting a Labradoodle because they really don't shed as much. Is that a problem? And this is a physician saying this, so this is the reason I bring this up is because it's not necessarily common knowledge. People say, oh, that's a hypoallergenic dog or a hypoallergenic cat, but it's really not because anything that is a mammal sheds off skin. And it's actually the skin proteins and also the saliva proteins that we are allergic to. It's not their fur. It's not the stuff that they shed off that you can see. So there's really never a hypoallergenic dog or cat, although there are some that lick themselves less than others, some that have less of the protein than others, but still, he and I had a talk about, you know, it's not a good idea because his children are actually exquisitely sensitive to dog dander. But if you want to, there are also alternative pets. Now, they're not the same as a cuddly little puppy or a kitten or anything like that, but there are fish. 
Fish do not cause allergies, okay? And neither do reptiles. There are a lot of, uh, and, and again, they're not cuddly in, as, as a kitten or anything like that, but, um, you know, there are a lot of reptiles that make perfectly good pets, um, such as the anoles. They're like little tiny li lizards. Um, and there are other things like turtles and some, some other things that can be a pet. And so consider that, that you can have pets, even though they're not the ones that you may want to, to, uh, to have. But there are alternatives. Then there are some other causes that we'll touch upon. Um, one is the venoms, such as bees, wasps, hornets, and something we don't have here, but I include because people do travel to the south, fire ants. I'm curious, have anybody, has anybody here heard of fire ants? I thought maybe some of you might. Yeah, I used to, and actually I lived and I trained, did my ENT training in, in San Antonio, Texas, where fire ants are just about as common as any insect. You have to watch them because they make these mounds. If you've never seen a fire ant mound, it's not the little tiny mounds of dust or dirt that we see around here. They make mounds about this big around. And they are vicious. They don't like you and they don't like you coming anywhere near them. In fact, if you stomp on the ground next to a fire ant mound, it will just start getting rabid with activity. The, the ants will just come out and start swarming up at the top of the mound. That's one of the threats they gave us in basic training. Mm -hmm. If you did shape up, we're going to set you on that fire ant mound. Is that right? It was effective, wasn't it? That was a pretty good threat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so fire ants is something that I mentioned because you may go down south. Uh, and then, of course, all of the uh, stinging insects such as bees, wasps, and hornets. If you know that you're sensitive to these, then you need to carry the stuff with you to treat that at all times because you just never know when you're going to be exposed. And that would include an EpiPen as well as some Benadryl or another antihistamine. And so that's something that, that you and your doctor can work on. And the um, other things that you might be sensitive to, some drugs such as penicillin, that's a that's one I get a lot where my mom was allergic to penicillin, so I bet I am too, so just don't give me penicillin. Well, it doesn't work that way, thankfully. But uh, nonetheless, you can be sensitive to drugs. You can have allergy to latex, which is something that we watch out for a lot in ENT because we do a lot of operations. Operations involve a lot of gloves, and so we have to be careful to use latex-free gloves if we're operating on somebody that is a latex-sensitive person. We also have food proteins such as milk, eggs, peanuts. Peanuts are, are a big one. For some reason we can really be sensitive to peanuts. And um, so if you are peanut allergic, there are some resources out there, tons of them, but there is a good website, peanutallergy.com, where there are a lot of resources as to educating the people around you about what peanut allergy means. That means when you go over to grandma's house, no grandma, you can't just sneak in one little peanut butter cookie. It's not okay. No, when you go to school, you can't have them sharing snacks that have been cooked with peanut oil or that have peanuts in them, for example. So there's a lot to it, but most of it involves education and avoidance when it comes to peanut allergy. And then there are also chemicals. This is something that's interesting. Most of the time, you're not really allergic to the chemicals, but you're sensitive to the chemicals. Such as, you know, somebody comes in and says, you know, I can't stand perfumes. Somebody wears strong perfume, it just pushes me over the edge. I'm allergic to perfumes. Well, it is conceivable, but it's not very likely. It's more likely that you are sensitive to the chemical in the perfumes as opposed to true allergy that was mediated by that antibody that I told you, that IgE. But nonetheless, you're sensitive to it, and we have to figure out what to do to treat that. So when do allergies appear? This is a graph that shows when, by age, between age 0 and age 70, are you likely to show up with allergies. Boys tend to show up just a little bit earlier. Usually you're starting to see around maybe 12 to 15, up until maybe the late teens or early 20s. Women, it tends to be a little bit more gradual than that, uh, 20s. And I have a lot of moms that come in that after they've been pregnant, they say, you know what, I didn't have any allergy problems until after I was pregnant. And interestingly enough, the hormones of pregnancy can change your body and your body's immune system, but also you tend to be pregnant about the same time that you